This video will present a case study of Avexis, a gene therapy company that developed the most expensive drug in the world and potentially cured the leading genetic cause of infant death. It's a good example of the challenges of developing drugs using innovative technology, an illustration of the importance of picking the right killer application for a new technology, and it also highlights some of the social and political issues that are relevant to the drug industry today. This case study is ad adapted from a few talks I've given in prior programs. So a couple of things may be a little bit uh, out of date, but I'll provide context on the latest developments where appropriate. So to understand the company, we have to understand the disease that they're trying to treat. Avexis is developing drugs to treat spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. It's a rare genetic disease with fewer than 1,000 new cases per year for the most severe form of the disease. It's caused by a deletion or loss of function mutations in the SMN1 gene, which ultimately results in motor neuron loss, progressive weakness, and in the most severe form, death. Despite its rarity, it's the most common genetic cause of infant death, with 90% of patients who have the most severe form of the disease dying or requiring continuous ventilation before age two. It's a really terrible disease. So to understand the company's strategy for treating this disease, it's worth taking a minute or two to briefly go over the pathology. So the images that I'll go through uh, for the next couple minutes are taken from another YouTube video, which has a, a really great basic overview of the biology. Uh, it's linked here at the bottom of the screen, and I'll also put a link in the description. Uh, I believe it's from a group called uh, openosmosis.org. So overall, the ultimate effect of the loss of function mutation in SMA is that lower motor neurons die. When these neurons die, uh, the motor neuron, or the motor unit, which is comprised of a neuron and muscle fibers, stops working. When this happens, your muscles are weak, they atrophy, and eventually lose their function. So what causes the death of these neurons in the first place? It's caused by the loss of function mutation in the SMN1 gene that we mentioned earlier. So SMN is a protein that's expressed in all cells. It's an essential protein, but it's required in much larger amounts to carry out specific functions in motor neurons, although those exact functions are unclear. So most cells can survive or operate normally with just a limited amount of the SMN protein. But motor neurons that have a low amount of SMN protein die. This is an important fact because there are two genes that express SMN, SMN1, which is mutated in spinal muscular atrophy, and SMN2, which is still functional in SMA. However, SMN2 is a mutated backup gene that's overall about 99% identical to SMN1, with the exception of a single mutation that leads to exon 7 being spliced out in a majority of the translated proteins. So if you're not familiar with this kind of biology, essentially what happens is the protein that SMN2 codes for lacks a specific part of the protein. And that rins, renders the, that SMN2 protein uh, essentially non-functional. It's just degraded very quickly in the body. So again, most SMN2 proteins lack exon 7 and are non-functional. But about 10% of SMN2 proteins are functional. So there is a little bit of residual SMN protein, even in SMA patients. And again, for normal cells that only require a little bit of SMN, this is enough protein for them to function. However, the motor neurons don't have enough SMN protein and die. One final important fact to mention here is that individuals have different copy numbers of SMN2. So they have different numbers of the SMN2 gene. So individuals with more copies of this gene will end up having more fully functional SMN and thus a better prognosis. This relationship between genetics and clinical prognosis is clearly illustrated here on this slide. So I'll, I'll pause for a little bit to let you take a, a quick look at this slide. We won't go over everything in detail, um, but it's important to take a look at a couple of these, a couple of these factors. So as we mentioned, type 1 SMA is the most severe form of SMA. 
In this form of the disease, individuals only have two copies of the SMN2 backup gene. In less severe forms, type 2, 3, or 4, individuals have more copies of the SMN protein. And as you see, the symptoms are, are, are much better. In type 4 patients, you actually see most of them living into adulthood and having a, a fairly decent quality of life. Whereas patients with type 1, fewer than 10% survive uh, t up to two years without being continuously ventilated or unfortunately passing away. So this is pretty much the definition of an unmet medical need. This is a horrible disease, and you know, this is sort of a, an unemotional and, and, and factual way of describing the disease, but it's, it's pretty catastrophic. This is a horrible disease, and there's a lot of um, you know, pretty moving videos online about what patients go through. Um, the good news is that there are also a lot of great information I will discuss later about the effect of this drug on these patients. Um, so this is, in a way, a very inspiring story uh, of what drug development can do at its best. So we've discussed the biology, we've discussed the unmet need. How do we address this? How do we solve this? So the job of the pharma company is to find treatments for diseases. There's a lot of different tools you can apply to develop a solution. What's the right set of technologies to develop a solution for SMA? So again, this is caused by, SMA is caused by the lack of a particular protein that's vital to motor neuron function. So intuitively, you might think that a protein therapy could be a good idea, right? You can recombinantly produce proteins and deliver them to patients. Uh, however, unfortunately, in this disease, the protein carries out its important functions within cells. And as you know, most of you who are biologists know, generally proteins have trouble crossing cell membranes and getting into cells. So administering exogenous protein is, is probably not viable here. What about gene therapy? Uh, so gene therapy, uh, in short, is basically when you deliver a new gene to cells to express a protein that they would not otherwise express. That seems like a pretty direct way to address this pathology. And there's actually specific um, viral vectors that carry the gene to target cells that target motor neurons pretty well. So it makes sense that you could potentially deliver the right gene to the right cells and remedy the pathology. AV9 ther gene therapy does have a major limitation, which is that patients generally develop immunity to the viral vector after one dose. So you can generally only dose patient patients once. In the case of motor neurons, this is not as much of a drawback because neurons are very long-lived cells. So if you get a working copy of the gene into neurons, you know, in theory, neurons will produce this protein indefinitely or and survive and uh, produce the protein in the body indefinitely. But gene therapy is a newer modality. It's more expensive and risky to develop. And until uh, a couple years ago, um, there were no FDA-approved gene therapies. So when, the, when Avexis was developing this gene therapy, there was literally no precedent of a, a, a drug like it being approved. So are there more established ways to treat this disease? Another approach is to deliver antisense oligonucleotides to correct the splicing error in SMN2. So if you recall, we mentioned that the SMN2 protein is unstable because part of the protein is spliced out. Uh, the gene is not properly translated into proteins, essentially. It's missing a piece. It may be possible to use antisense oligonucleotides to prevent the splicing error by binding to mRNA and preventing exon 7 from being spliced out. So that's a potentially viable treatment. What about small molecules? That's sort of the traditional workhorse of, uh, of biopharmaceutical development. It's unclear initially whether that would work. There may be some way to use a small molecule to indirectly increase SMN, two levels, but we'd need a, a better understanding of the biology and, and this protein's pathway to know whether we can use a small molecule here. So Avexis decided to use the gene therapy approach. As discussed earlier, this is a very direct way to address the cause of the disease. The disease is caused by low levels of important protein, and gene therapy increases levels of that protein in target cells. So this slide is from Avexis's investor presenta or a pre presentation at a conference from 2017, and I include it here because it shows how they've not just picked the right modality for the disease, but they've specifically designed a gene therapy 
specifically for the pathology of SMA. Of, uh, SMA. So briefly, a few of the key components they designed uh, are the recombinant AAV9 capsid, which we discussed earlier, is able to cross the blood-brain barrier, get into the spinal cord, and motor neurons. It can be very difficult to get uh, virals, viruses or any other molecules to neurons in many cases, so it's really important that you pick the right, the right delivery mechanism for this disease. It's also uh, AAV9 is a virus that doesn't replicate, and it doesn't modify the existing DNA of a patient. So in general, you know, if you talk about viruses, it's usually a dangerous thing for patients. But AV9 is one that's been specifically uh, selected because it does not pose that kind of danger to patients. They also have a continuous promoter, which basically means the gene is continuously and sustainably expressed rather than being expressed variably or being expressed sometimes and not expressed other times. And then obviously they deliver the, the full human SMN transgene, so they have a full copy of the stable and functional protein. So does this work? Based on a very small study, it seems to work extraordinarily well. So recall that 90% of patients with type 1 SMA either die or require continuous ventilation by age 2. And in this small study, 100% of patients who had been on the drug for 20 months were still alive. This is an extraordinary outcome. According to the natural history of the disease, only 8% of patients would still be alive and not require continuous ventilation at this time point. But 100% of patients in this study did reach that milestone. And usually a small study like this with its open label, not randomized or controlled, you would be suspicious of, of the results. Uh, but for a study like this, where the effect size is so dramatic, you're going from 8% of patients uh, surviving to 100% of them surviving at a given time point. And where the endpoint is so objective, uh, is the patient alive or does the patient require continuous ventilation, you can have more confidence that the effect you're seeing is, is due to drug. Of course, it isn't perfect, but when you're studying a drug in such a small disease where there's so few patients and the patients are in such, such dire straits, um, sometimes it makes sense to, to take some, take a little bit of liberties with the, st the study design so you can actually run a trial that helps patients get drug and survive. So here's another slide with a little bit more data from the study. Uh, you can pause the video here and, and, and read through it if you'd like to, but I'll just highlight that not only do these patients survive, but a lot of them are hitting development milestones that they would never have hit otherwise. So a majority of the patients are sitting unassisted and two of them could crawl, stand, and walk independently. Without this drug, patients would not be able to do any of this. They wouldn't be able to sit, crawl, or walk, but a lot of these patients are actually able to do that. And it seems to be safe, uh, based on the short duration of, of treatment and the small number of patients in this study. So this seems like a very promising treatment. It's taking a severe, life-threatening, fatal disease, and not only is keeping patients alive, but is giving them uh, the developmental milestones and the quality of life that they would never expect without a drug like this. But it isn't the only product in development for this disease. And with only a few thousand patients a year, it's not clear that there's room for too many products on the market. So recall earlier we mentioned it might be possible to develop small molecule drugs or antisense therapies for SMA. And it turns out that there are other companies doing those exact things. So a company called Biogen developed an antisense oligonucleotide therapy for SMA and was actually the first product to market in the disease. And Roche is developing a small molecule that's a bit behind uh, Avexis's product. So just quickly here, all of these studies were pretty small. Um, you know, none of them were large, well-controlled, uh, randomized controlled studies. And you can't really compare between trials, but it looks like the Avexis drug, just based on this sort of ad hoc comparison, is is not bad. So AVXS 101, uh, Avexis's product, their gene therapy for SMA, seems like a very valuable drug with a, a pretty competitive profile. But is it worth $9 billion? Novartis acquired Avexis for $8.7 billion. When I first did this case study in 2018, Avexis was only worth about $3 billion. Not much changed in terms of new data or developments of the company between when it was valued at $3 billion 
and when Novartis bought it for triple that price. Is it really worth that much? What was Novartis thinking when they acquired this company? The $9 billion price tag is even more ridiculous when you consider that Avex has only had outcomes data on a few dozen type 1 SMA patients, and there are only a few hundred new cases of type 1 SMA in the US per year. How's a product with a few hundred customers worth $9 billion? So for comparison, Dropbox, which is a, a product and a company you may all be familiar with, has hundreds of millions of paying customers and is only worth about $7 billion as of March 2020. The answer to that is Dropbox costs $10 a month, and these gene therapies cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So most medicines are small molecules or proteins. They've been around for decades. New classes of drugs like gene therapy or antisense therapy or cell therapy can do things that small molecules or traditional protein drugs can't. But the technology is new. We haven't figured out how to develop and manufacture these products efficiently and they cost a lot of money. However, they cost a little bit too much money. I mean, obviously there's sticker shock associated with prices like that, but it's just not worth it in many cases. The health economic benefit provided by these drugs is not worth the price that they charge in many cases. And the first few gene therapies that were approved completely failed. Payers weren't willing to pay the million dollar price tags for these products and the companies that developed them ended up winding down the programs because they weren't commercially viable. For some newer therapies, there's actually arguments made that they're cost effective depending on the methodology that you use, um, but they're still not reimbursable. So there's a couple or, or several very complex issues at play here. There's the price being too high, uh, they're not cost effective, and there's also just access industries, uh, access issues, uh, reimbursement issues, and other logistical issues as well. But the bottom line is, these drugs are very expensive. And Novartis's plans for AVXS 101 is for it to be even more expensive. The most expensive drug ever, at up to $4 million per patient. So this is a slide deck that Novartis put out a few months after their acquisition. And what they're doing here is making the argument that AVXS 101 is cost effective at a price up to about four or five million dollars. This might explain why Avexis, why Novartis paid so much for Avexis. And for the record, I don't think the data supports the Zolgens being cost effective at four million or even that two million that Novartis ended up charging. But it's worth asking why a drug would cost that much in the first place. So people do debate a lot about what it costs to develop a drug. In the prior videos, I've walked through some examples from academic studies um, that involve a lot of assumptions and not a ton of transparency around the methodology for calculating the cost of a drug. But this data here is from Avexis's SEC filings. These are public audited financial statements showing how much they spent uh, in developing their drug over the years. I made a few estimates around the 2018 numbers because at the time uh, that they were acquired and filed their last financial reports, they only had reported through the first quarter of the year. So I just basically took the first quarter numbers and extrapolated that throughout the full year. From 2013 to 2018, Avexis spent almost $800 million developing their drug. And by that time, it wasn't even approved. And again, they studied the drug in only about 15 patients. And to get to that point, they spent almost $800 million. So here I'm going to do a little bit of hand waving and present a little bit of um, financial analysis um, around how that three billion dollar valuation uh, came into play. So we do have data from investor and equity research reports that show the methodology for calculating the three billion dollar valuation that Avex has had uh, a few months before it was acquired. We don't have Novartis's proprietary analysis that shows how they got to nine billion, so we we can't use that here. Um, but I think it's worth going through this exercise uh, to help understand where these valuations come from. So you may have seen some, some data like this before. This is uh, essentially uh, a simplified um, revenue build for a, a, a drug. Uh, 
this is part of a, it's a financial modeling technique that investors use to determine um, what a company's worth. Essentially, what this shows is it calculates the total number of people who could be eligible for treatment with Avexis's product based on epidemiology data and the expected price per patient. So you multiply price by the number of patients and that basically gets you your revenue. So this slide goes through the rest of what is called the income statement. Um, so the income statement is essentially a record of all the revenue you get, all the expenses you spend, and then ultimately the profit you generate, for, uh, a company generates. So here, I won't go through all of this in detail, uh, but this, this describes the costs involved in developing and commercializing uh, AVXIS, AVXIS 101. And again, I'll mention that these are all projections. So um, these uh, estimates are from 2018, and they are projecting this future financial, financial performance of AVXIS from 2019 to uh, 2023 and beyond. So based on this analysis, the overall value of the equity of AVEXIS is about $3 billion. And again, a lot of that relies on a million dollar per patient price. But what if things don't go as planned? In AVEXIS's case, things actually went much better than planned. They were acquired for $9 billion. And if you asked investors, I I'm not sure how many of them would have predicted that that would happen. There probably would be some, but I'm not sure how many. Um, I did this analysis a few years ago before they were acquired uh, as, an extra, as, a, as a way to illustrate what the risks are uh, of drug development. So even though this is no longer uh, reflects a realistic possibility for the fate of Avexis, it's worth discussing this briefly just to highlight how risky drug development is. So here we go through four different downside scenarios. So the numbers we showed before are projections, they're estimates of what might happen with this company. What if those estimates are wrong? In the first scenario, we'll look at what if the epidemiology estimates prove to be incorrect? So the projected patients per year are based on epidemiology data from the literature. For a small disease like this, the epidemiology data is imperfect. Um, and Morgan Stanley ended up uh, the company that I, uh, investment bank, whose um, analysis I used in part for the uh, prior analysis, used the high end of the range of the incidence estimates for this disease, which is an aggressive assumption. If you simply choose a more conservative assumption, use the lower range uh, of the incidence estimates, that results in about an 11% decrease in the value of the company. So that's a, a pretty uh, pedantic exercise, but it just shows that these models and the valuations of companies are very sensitive to assumptions. But what if there's a more material change in the company? So not just some sort of modeling issue, but what if the business reality is less uh, positive than what's projected? So these next three cases illustrate downside operational scenarios. So the first one, what if competition is stronger than expected? As we mentioned, there were competing drugs uh, from Biogen, uh, which was co-developed with Ionis that are on the market, and a drug from Roche that seems to be pretty promising as well. It's possible that a lot of patients take these competing drugs or that payers demand a lower price for Avexis's product uh, in exchange for covering their product rather than, than competing products. So if we decrease some of the assumptions around market penetration and price per patient, that decreases the projected value of Avexis by over 40%. In the third scenario, what if FDA requires a longer development plan? So recall that the data we saw from Avexis was from a study of only a few dozen patients with this disease. It was uncontrolled, non-randomized, and in general, had a lot of design inadequacies. It wasn't designed to the, the level of rigor that FDA is used to seeing. So this wasn't even likely to be the case back then. It wasn't likely that FDA would require you know, larger studies, just given the unmet need and the effects I've seen in the earlier studies. Uh, and there's also regulatory incentives for developing drugs, treating severe rare diseases. Um, but what this illustrates is that developing the drug using this technology for almost any other disease would not be feasible. If you were not studying, um, if you were using the same technology that had the same cost of developing it, right, that cost of $800 million just to get to the point where you could study it in a few dozen patients, 
if you were studying that in a disease where the unmet need was less severe and FDA was less accommodating in terms of the amount of data it needed to approve the product, the product would be essentially uninvestable. So what we model here is if uh, you had to run an additional study or two that would require uh, three additional years before you're FDA approved and would cost uh, an additional 120 million or so to run. If you incorporate that into the model, that reduces the value of the company by over 80% to around five or 600 million. And remember that it took $800 million just to get uh, AVXS 101 developed to the point where you could submit it for approval. And then the last case scenario we look at is what if the drug failed a pivotal study? Uh, so again, this is not likely based on the, the data that we'd seen, but you can't know uh, before you go into a drug program um, how likely it is to succeed in pivotal studies. And in many cases, uh, drugs do fail pivotal studies. And uh, when that happens, the companies generally are worth only the, the cash that they have in the bank. And in this case, that would be about a 90% reduction in the value of Avexis. So again, none of these actually happened. The company ended up getting acquired for $9 billion, which kind of shows you just how crazy and volatile and risky drug development is. Um, but I just wanted to discuss this exercise because it, it puts a more quantitative point on some of the risks inherent in drug development. And I hope it also emphasized how important it is to pick the right initial indication for a new technology and how expensive it can be to take a completely new therapeutic modality and bring it to market for the first time. So for any of you who are thinking about developing uh, products based on any kind of new you know, synthetic biology or gene editing or any sort of advanced uh, innovative modality, those are definitely very promising avenues as you see here, but it's really important to think carefully about the risks of the program and to pick the right initial application. So Vexus acquired uh, or Novartis acquired Avexis back in, uh, in the second quarter of 2018, and here we are about two years later. Uh, how is the bet playing out for Novartis? So Zolgensma, which is the brand name of AVXS 101, received FCA approval uh, in May 2019, about a year after Novartis acquired the company. You may have seen some reports that there were data is integrity issues actually around the AVXS 101 program which were apparently not related to the clinical study or, or anything that would affect the perceived safety or effectiveness of the drug. Um, but there were nonetheless some concerning findings about data integrity related to some of the preclinical work. FCA ultimately decided not to penalize Novartis for this. And in 2019, uh, Zolgensma generated $361 million in sales. So it was only on the market for a few months in 2019, but it generated a significant amount of, of revenue for Novartis. And that revenue is likely fairly, fairly profitable, I would, I would estimate, although I, I don't have any visibility into that. So at this point, the future is uncertain with respect to how this bet's gonna play out. $9 billion probably represents a best case scenario for how this drug performs. Uh, it will either have to uh, significantly grow its revenue or the Avexis platform will have to lead to additional valuable products for this to ultimately be worth it. And all of that is not even considering the you know, social, ethical, and political implications of relying on incredibly high-priced drugs like this um, as your business model. Uh, it may not be sustainable. It may not even be ethical. It really um, it's, it's a pretty complex question. Uh, but hopefully this example uh, helps you think through the uh, challenges and opportunities in bringing to market uh, drugs based on innovative technologies. Um, the rewards can be significant, not just for investors and for the company, but for patients. Again, this is a potential cure for a disease that would otherwise kill 90% of patients before age two. Um, this is one of the most revolutionary medicines that at least I've heard of. Um, and it would be great for the world if there were more products like this out there. Um, but it's again, it's not an easy road and it's very hard and very difficult to pick the right indication and the right clinical development plan to navigate the complexities uh, involved in this process. Um, so hopefully this was a, was a useful video.
Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to, to let me know in the comments.